Here we go again with another deep dive into comparing the literary and cinematic worlds, this time featuring Knock at the Cabin and The Cabin at the End of the World. By the time you see this, M. Night Shyamalan's new movie, Knock at the Cabin, will have been playing in theaters for perhaps a week or so, depending on what my publishing schedule ends up looking like. A couple days before it came out, I posted one of my one-minute horror movie reviews of it, but I also promised a deeper dive into comparing the movie with the book on which it's based. That book is, in case some of you don't know, the Cabin at the End of the World by Paul Tremblay. Let's begin by getting something out of the way. I don't like that they changed the title between the book and the movie. I've seen this happen several times. Changing titles, quite frankly, confuses people, though. I remember back in the day when Brian Keene was publishing with Leisure Books, a lot of his paperbacks were released with different titles from the limited edition hardcovers. Some people were confused by it. I recently had a conversation on the Do You Like Scary Movies podcast with the guys at the film company Majama about their movie Bad CGI Sharks, and they mentioned that some stores wanted them to change the name just to Sharks, which completely missed the point of what the movie was. And just as an aside, if you're interested in listening to that or any of the other episodes of the podcast, there will be relevant links to that and all kinds of other great information down in the What's It So... We should check all that out. We can argue about which is a better title. The Cabin at the End of the World is perhaps more informative. Knock at the Cabin is certainly shorter and maybe punchier. But my complaint isn't about either title on its own so much as that they changed the title. So now we have to refer to it by both names whenever we want to compare the book to the movie. Authors, publishers, and filmmakers, heed my advice. Stop changing titles around. Anyway, now that I've got that off my chest, let's get into the real discussion. First, don't worry about spoilers for now. I'll be starting off with some spoiler-free discussion. When the time comes that I need to discuss the ending, and I do need to discuss the ending, I'll give you ample warning. Okay, let's start with the basics. Paul Tremblay has developed quite a reputation as a horror author in recent years. His first novel to really make a big splash was A Head Full of Ghosts in 2015, which I guess we could call sort of a postmodern demonic possession story. Since then, readers have been praising his work all around the genre. The Cabin at the End of the World came out in 2018 and won both the Bram Stoker Award and the Locus Award. Even before the book was available to the public, I understand, in 2017, Film Nation acquired the rights to adapt the novel. Steve Desmond and Michael Sherman wrote a draft screenplay. M. Night Shyamalan then revised the screenplay and directed the film, now called Knock at the Cabin, which came out on February 3rd of this year, 2023. The premise of both stories is that a family is vacationing at a remote cabin. The family consists of a gay couple, Andrew and Eric, and their adopted daughter, Wynn. The cabin is invaded by a group of four individuals who tell them that they need to choose to voluntarily sacrifice one of themselves in order to prevent the apocalypse. So in that regard, it starts off a lot like a fairly standard home invasion story, but then it has a lot of layers over the top of that. Of course, the family doesn't believe the message, and they think that they've been specifically targeted, but the invaders themselves, aside from the crime that they're committing, behave rather politely, so it sort of plays with a lot of dichotomies in some pretty interesting ways. The book is widely considered to be Tremblay's best work. I don't quite agree with that, though the reasons why will have to wait until I get to a spoiler section. But what I will say is that most of the book, I do think, is his best work, and it's really only the conclusion that I didn't think worked out quite as well as what preceded it. And what about the movie, on the other hand? It's honestly a mostly faithful adaptation. 
There are some differences, particularly in the ending, and we will get to those, but a fair amount of the screenplay was lifted directly from the book. So it's really quite similar most of the time. Obviously, the book gives us greater depth of characterization and internal monologue, partly because it alternates point of view between all the different characters, so we really get to feel like we know everyone involved in the story. The movie keeps true to the characters, but of course it can't give us that internal reality, so it's not quite as deep. But in exchange for that, we get to see some truly excellent performances. Dave Bautista as Leonard really stole the show. In many ways, I found Leonard to be the main character of both the book and the movie, although I think Trimbley would argue that the three victims are meant to be the main characters. And it's really nice to see Dave Bautista demonstrating his acting ability. Normally, we seem to see him in action movies, which are certainly fun, and he's good in them, but it turns out he has a much greater range than just being the big, tough action star, so that was really nice to see. Both the book and the movie are full of religious symbolism, though the movie makes it a bit more explicit. I suspect at least some of the symbolism in the book would have gone unnoticed by a lot of readers if Tremblay hadn't included some author's notes explaining them, uh, at least in this paperback edition. For example, it's significant that there are seven main characters, the three victims and the four invaders, and that Wynne and Leonard capture seven grasshoppers at the beginning of the story. The initial knock at the cabin from which the movie's title was taken likewise consists of seven distinct raps in both the book and film versions. The seven characters are meant to evoke the seven seals of revelation. Similarly, the four invaders, Leonard, Redmond, Adrian, and Sabrina, all have seven letter names and they are meant to represent the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But at the same time, we're not considering them to be literally the four horsemen. Throughout much of the story, we're playing not only with apocalyptic themes, but the very nature of belief itself. Just as the other characters don't believe in the apocalypse they're meant to prevent, we are meant to question the reality of the invaders' claims throughout the story. It's that conflict, much more than any fear of home invasion, that really drives the story. One of the family members in particular, the character Andrew, is aggressively skeptical of the claims, understandably so, and insists that they've been attacked by a religious cult who target them because they're a same-sex couple. That element is present in both the book and the movie. Perhaps we could understand why such a character would think that, though honestly it's one of the least effective parts of the story, because even if we don't believe in the apocalypse, the invaders never really give us any reason to suspect that their motivations are what Andrew thinks they are. Well, there may be one clue that might point him further in that direction, but that's going to have to wait for a spoiler section that I'll get to in a minute. But mostly there are no hints that that is the motivation behind this attack. The movie does go further than the book to explicitly explain a lot of its symbolism, though not quite all of it, and some of it has to wait until the final act before we're expected to really understand it. To really understand where the book and movie are different, though, we need to move into some pretty heavy spoiler territory, and that's where we're headed in just a moment. If you don't care about spoilers, keep watching. If you do worry about spoilers, just know that for the rest of this video, I'm going to explicitly discuss both the book and the movie, including their endings. If you don't want to see that, then do me a favor and go ahead and like and comment before you leave, subscribe and ring that notification bell, and then head over and watch any of my other wonderful videos. For those of you choosing to stay, here we go. One of the things I've noticed on reading movie reviews of Knock at the Cabin is that it seems fairly polarizing. Most people seem to either love or hate it, and not a whole lot of people were in the middle. Part of that, I think, is because people were expecting an M. Night Shyamalan film to have a twistier twist at the end, and this one really doesn't. 
However, while the ending of the book and movie are fairly similar, I actually preferred the ending of the movie. Mostly. To understand why, let's step back a little bit and summarize what happens. In the book, the family don't believe the invaders. The four invaders then sacrifice one of their own, Redmond, and then turn on the television to reveal that a tsunami has wiped out a city. Andrew insists that they knew the footage would be airing, an objection he'll keep offering as similar events develop throughout the book, less and less convincingly each time. A bit later, it's revealed that, unlike the other four, Redmond actually had a past with Andrew, which we'll get to in a moment, but for now, let me just quickly summarize the rest of the book. At one point, Andrew manages to escape and retrieve a firearm he had back in his car. In the ensuing fight, he kills Adrienne. As the fight continues, Andrew and Leonard struggle for the gun and it accidentally goes off, shooting the young daughter, Wynne, in the process. However, because her death was not a voluntary sacrifice, it didn't satisfy the rules, and another sacrifice was still necessary to prevent the apocalypse. Meanwhile, more disasters occur, this time in the form of a plague. As the characters continue struggling between belief and skepticism, with the victim, Eric, now beginning to believe, and the invader, Sabrina, beginning to doubt, the book picks up the pace. Eventually, Sabrina kills Leonard and offers to help Andrew and Eric escape. Disasters on the television continue in the form of a series of unexplained plane crashes. Eventually, Sabrina shoots herself in the head and Andrew and Eric move on. They never make the choice to make a sacrifice, and the book ends with their defiant refusal. Tremblay explained in his uh, notes at the end of the book that he wanted the book to end on a note of defiant hope, rather than confirming whether the apocalypse would occur or not. While I have nothing against defiant hope, my problem with that ending, which I really didn't care for at all, is that both the events and the symbolism throughout the book are so heavy that there's really no doubt about whether the apocalypse is real or not. It is. The real heart of the book then, at least for me, has nothing to do with the question of belief versus skepticism, though those debates are interesting through the earlier part of the book, but the real heart of it for me seems to be the question of family versus humanity, whether one could sacrifice oneself or one's closest loved ones to save the world. And if not, what kind of life would they have in the aftermath? That's a really horrific choice to have to make, but the book's ending completely sidestepped the issue, at least as far as I'm concerned. Because of that, Tremblay's self-admitted fear that Wynne's death would be the emotional climax of the book turned out to be true, at least for me. It's not that the 80 or 100 pages between that event and the book's actual ending are boring, far from it. It's just that the actual climax gets emotionally and intellectually overshadowed by its predecessor. The movie takes a different approach. Most of the same events still happen. It does, for example, end with all four invaders dead. However, things happen slightly out of order, and a couple things happen differently, and it makes a big difference. First of all, Wynne doesn't get killed in the movie. I'm pretty sure that's just Hollywood taking the coward's way out and refusing to do that to a child, but that was a big mistake. That part of the book absolutely gets better. However, the movie gets the actual ending better. Adrienne gets sacrificed, much as Redmond does, Andrew shoots Sabrina, and then Leonard sacrifices himself. So they all still end up dead, but in a different way and in a different order. That part doesn't really make much of a difference to me. But what does make a difference is that at the end of the movie, Eric finally convinces Andrew that all the events were real and volunteers to sacrifice himself to save the world. Andrew and Wynne then realize they've averted the apocalypse. We get the confirmation that everything was in fact true. And father and daughter move on with a semi-happy ending. That decision, the climactic self-sacrifice, is a much more satisfying ending, at least from where I sit. But it's not the kind of twist people were expecting from Shyamalan. 
I think that M. Night thought that the apocalypse is real was the twist. I think we were meant to be on Andrew's side throughout the story, thinking it was just an ordinary home invasion. But the problem is, much as was the case in the book, the skeptical perspective just didn't hold water once news reports started showing up demonstrating that the apocalypse was really happening. At one point, Eric even sees a sort of shimmering figure standing behind the invaders, and we are meant to question whether it was real or the result of his concussion, but the coincidences are just too many to ignore. So anyway, though it ended up not being much of a twist, the movie, for my money, delivered a more satisfying ending than the book did. We also need to talk about Redmond, the first of the invaders to get killed. It's revealed in both versions that he isn't actually Redmond. That's a false name. He's actually someone who once attacked Andrew in a bar. The book uses that mostly to help build skepticism regarding whether the apocalypse is real or not. Fair enough. The movie takes it in a slightly different direction, explicitly explaining that each of these four horsemen of the apocalypse represents a different aspect of humanity. Redmond represents malice, so his presence as somebody who once maliciously attacked Andrew makes more sense in that light. One thing I didn't like as much about the movie, though, is that the four horsemen are made to seem to be more active in their roles. In the book, they're just messengers. In the movie, it's suggested that their self-sacrifices are responsible for unleashing the plagues or catastrophes. While that's more in line with the religious symbolism of the Four Horsemen, I actually prefer that in the book they're not particularly complicit in the destruction, but simply messengers of it. Because one of the best things about the story, and it's true in both versions, but even more so in the book, is that there doesn't really seem to be any villain here. We're not necessarily meant to like Redmond, but that's about as far as it goes. The invaders aren't evil. They're ordinary people, just like the victims are, drawn into something that they don't understand and don't even want to do, but they're deprived of any real choice. To do nothing would be even worse than the horrible things they have to do. There's something quite brilliant about a home invasion story in which the perpetrators are just as sympathetic as the victims. And there's something quite creepy about characters like Sabrina, Adrian, and especially Leonard, these perfectly ordinary and even kind and caring kinds of people, demonstrating their humanity, caring for people, cleaning up after themselves, even as they do all of these horrible things. So that's basically where I stand. I have to say, I liked both the book and the movie, and much to my surprise, I liked them more or less equally. For all their similarities, their respective strengths and weaknesses seem perfectly complementary. Or to put it another way, the book chickened out on the ending and the movie chickened out with Wind's death. Neither one is perfect, but if you read and watch them both and sort of mentally combine them, the result is, if not perfect, at least pretty close to it. And that brings us to the end of our discussion. Do make sure you stick around for my next video as we continue our exploration of anything and everything horrific. And until next time, as always, take care and stay scared.